Hello, hello, hello! Greetings, salutations! Konnichiwa and every other form of green across this vast, marvelous, multiverse! I am Matsu Quinox. This is Horse, and welcome back, my dear, marvelous, wonderful scholars, to the study. <laughs> hello there, hello there. Oh my goodness, I hurt my throat. Hello there, hello there, hello there. Hello there, Yulian20. Welcome. Congratulations on getting first. What a beautiful day, even though it snowed. Oh, it snowed? Huh. Wow. Wow, that's something to hear. Uh, hello there, Firefly. Welcome. Hello there, Cool Skeleton. Welcome. Mostly rainy where I am. Oh, really? Wow. Firefly, it's unseasonably warm here. No snow for us. Oh, hello there, Private Maverick. Corn. Candy corn. <laughs> Private Maverick, 50s here with clear skies. Nice, nice. And Yulian, 20. Do we want another evil laugh? Let's do another evil laugh. <laughs> Ah, that's that's hard to on my throat. So yes, hello there, my dear marvelous scholars. Once again, it is the night of spookiness, the night of terror, the night of witches roaming, the night which we may call Halloween. Hello there, hello there, hello. Ah, my dear scholars, Are you, tonight is a special night, is it not? Oh, I hope everyone's got their spookiness ready. Um, so, as for myself, well, you know, normally I would, uh, I would have something like a backdrop or something that would be a little bit spooky, but apparently, in my infinite wisdom, I forgot to put it up. I forgot to save it. So we are just going to be doing it here in the reading room. Just imagine it being extra spooky scary. Alright? Just extra spooky scary for all of you. Oh, hello there, Dr. Zadium. Welcome! Yulian20 ate too much candy. Well, well, is there any time that you can't eat, you know, candy like that? I mean, we, we have a candy bowl right here, Horace and I. Um... We were waiting for trick-or-treaters, but uh, apparently the study decided not to manifest a door. So uh, we um, we haven't had anyone. I mean, I'm very close to just eating the candy myself. Uh, it's actually kind of a little depressing, actually. We don't get a lot of visitors here, do we, Horace? Cool skeleton, no windows I either. Um, well, 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 we've got windows elsewhere, but we don't really see out there. Private Maverick, Lucky 7, this night for the kids. Yes, indeed, indeed. Fire, Firefly, I have a mostly black cat curled up beside me. Does that count? Aw, sweet. And congratulations on the 7th seventh, seventh stream streak, Private Maverick. Cool skill to no windows either. Oh, well, we, yeah, I already said that. I'll get to the radio voice in a second, Dr. Zadium. You in 20? Oh, kitty. Yes, kitties are sweet. Cool, wait, wait, what, what? Trick or treat? Uh, cool skeleton. Um, horse, get the candy bowl. Get the candy bowl. Okay, okay, um, okay. Do I have, do I have something that I can give you? Do I have anything I can give you? Um, okay, cool skeleton. I'll just give you one second, um. Oh my goodness, I have nothing. <laughs> Do I have anything I can give? Ah! Uh, I have nothing! Oh my goodness, I was gonna give you an emoticon, but it doesn't work. <laughs> give me a story, please. <laughs> oh, we will get to stories in a moment, yes! Um, oh, oh, oh. Oh yes, radio voice. Uh, let me get a drink of water. Um. Good evening, everyone here, and welcome back once again to Radio Matsu, where we strive to entertain you in all things. Tonight, it's Halloween, my dear marvelous scholars. 
and we're going to be listening to some spooky scaries and also enjoying a rather interesting spooky movie itself. It's right here at Radio Monsoon. <laughs> All right, I hope you enjoyed that, Dr. Zadium. Oh, oh, uh, sorry. The Galactic Cat came for a visit. But yes, um, tonight, tonight we have a twofold for here for Halloween. Halloween, I think. Um, we will be reading some spooky stories for a while. And then we'll take a little break. And then we'll come right back for a movie to finish off the night. A very special movie. A very interesting movie. Let's put it that way. One that's in the public domain, luckily. Um, but yes. I'm all prepared, my dear scholars. And these stories are from a couple of short story collections. Ones that I'm rather fond of. They're folk tales. So I am really looking forward to reading some of them. So, uh, my dear scholars. Shall we, uh, shall we begin Spooky Night? What say you? Oh... First off, what is everyone's favorite thing about Halloween? I want to know. My favorite thing is, of course, getting the chance to read spooky stories. Dr. Zadium Candy, of course. Of course, everyone's got a sweet tooth. Well, most people. Uh, I got my candy drawer right here. Julian 20 dressing up. Ooh, costumes. I have a costume somewhere myself. Unfortunately, I can't switch to it. Um, yes. Well, good. But yes, let's see. Story, story, story. Do we want a story? Shall we begin a story, my dear scholars? Cool skeleton candy, costumes, food, falling leaves. Man, I'm hungry. Oh, you're making me hungry too, cool skeleton. Aw. What do I have here? All right. So, my dear marvelous scholars, for tonight's spookiness, Sit back, relax, have a hot or cold beverage of your liking. Dim the lights if possible, my dear scholars. We're about to enter the horrifying world of spooky tales just for you. <laughs> I'm going to let's 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 skip the scary laugh. I I've been doing that too often. Okay, I'm not going to go in any order. I've got some cool skeleton. If you're hungry, why not have a little bug bite? What does that mean, cool skeleton? Of course, of course. You chose a bug, didn't you? Okay, where did I put the bugs? For those who missed last time, um, my bug drawer... The bugs melted. <laughs> All right, so cool skeleton, you have a choice between crickets or mealworms. Which will it be, crickets or mealworms? Oh, there's still, the boxes are still sticky. What shall be of your choosing? We'll go with crickets this time. All right. So the choices are. Salt and vinegar, bacon and cheddar, or sour cream and onion. Which one? Salt and vinegar, bacon and cheese, or sour cream and onion? I await your judgment. Sour cream, interesting. I don't think I ate much of these ones. Okay, come on, come on. Oh my goodness. And these are indeed whole crickets. With the legs, the eyes, the everything. And uh, when you're eating these, it's important to note that these things, you are eating the whole thing. I mean, it's not like they remove the viscera or anything like that. You are eating, their, you're eating the outside, the insides, the everything. All right, I'm going to take a sniff. I'm more of a pickle flavor person myself. <laughs> okay. And here we go. Little sour cream and onion uh, cricket. Uh, 
actually refer the crickets to the mealworms. Well. You know what? This one tastes really bad. Oh! Mm. Yeah, sour cream and onion tastes awful. Oh! Oh! Oh, God! Mm. Mm. Oh, that's... That's that's having trouble staying down. I got a... Got a leg stuck in my mouth. Note to self, sour cream and onion crickets taste awful. Ugh, oh. I'm gonna... I'm trying to get it to stay down. <sighs> okay, I think I got it. Okay, then. Ugh. I will let you know which one of my favorite crickets is. My favorite cricket is actually um, the... The salt and vinegar. Salt and vinegar is good. Cool skeleton. Is there a feed candy to Matsu redeem? There is not, unfortunately. I don't have enough snacks here to count as redeem. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So tonight, we are going to start off our first story from the United States with a tale from New Mexico entitled... The Death Waltz. In 1851, when New Mexico was still a territory and had not yet become a state, Fort Union was built 90 miles northeast of Santa Fe to protect people from Apache Indian raids. The fort helped keep the trails open so that huge red-wheeled freight wagons pulled by teams of mules or yokes of oxen could bring hardware, calico, and other goods to Santa Fe, while taking furs, hides, and Mexican mules and bur burros back to St. Louis, Missouri. Cool skeleton, get a big bag of gummy bears or jelly beans or whatever small candies you enjoy and eat on every time it's redeemed. <laughs> I will have to remember that if I can get some enough candy. Fort Union was the only spot for miles around, where an effort was made to keep up the appearances of gracious social life, such as was found east of the Missouri River. There were a number of very beautiful young ladies attached to the post, and the most attractive of them all was Elizabeth Bidwell, the sister-in-law of Captain Moore. She had recently come to Fort Union to stay with her sister, the captain's wife, because their parents were dead and the maiden aunt who had raised Elizabeth had become ill. Young Elizabeth enjoyed the excitement that came from living on an outpost where the threat of an Indian attack lurked always in the background. She was doubly delighted by the attentions the young officers paid to her, since there were few women who were both pretty and unmarried in that wild country. One lieutenant named Frank Sutter, recently transferred from the east, was especially attracted to Elizabeth's charms. He devoted himself to winning her hand, in spite of the other handsome officers who buzzed around her like bees discovering the sweetest blossom in a garden. Frank Sutter's experience with the world was not large enough so that he could tell whether a woman was responding seriously to his attentions or was merely flirting with him. He would walk with Elizabeth in the afternoon, when the sunny, clear air would turn in the blink of an eye to heavy rain that sent them scurrying for cover, then disappeared as quickly as it had begun to fall. They would sit together in the evening, watching the sky turn red, pink, orange, and yellow to the west, while the mountains to the east of the fort turned dark purple, dark purple, mysterious. At such times, Frank's would talk, Frank would talk to Elizabeth about many things, but he didn't dare tell the young woman, whose hand rested lightly on his arm, just what he felt for her. 
Elizabeth laughed and fanned herself and complained about the heat and chattered on about how bored she was growing with life at Fort Union and how eager she was to return to Missouri and the social life there. Such talk cut Lieutenant Sutter to the quick, but he never let his pain show. Then one day, messengers came racing to the fore with news of a series of Apache raids. Captain Moore ordered a detachment of troops to chase and punish the guilty Indians. Lieutenant Sutter was put in command of the expedition. The night before they were to set out, however, he called on Elizabeth Bidwell. Drawing her to a private corner of the porch, he dropped to his knee and said, Elizabeth, if you didn't guess it before, I'm telling you now, I'm in love with you. She smiled at him, then turned her head away and patted her heart. Finally, she said, Why, Lieutenant Sutter, I'm overwhelmed by the honor you're giving me. And do you have some affection for me? You don't even have to ask, she replied, blushing. Then, Miss Bidwell, will you do me the honor of marrying me when I return? He was the handsomest young officer in Fort Union, and his prospects were excellent. Elizabeth answered without thought or hesitation. Of course I will. But if the fortunes of war deprive me of life... Hush! she said. Don't even think of such a thing. If you should fail to return, I swear I will never marry another. Then, he said, rising to his feet and kissing her hand, you can be assured nobody else will have you. I will come back and make my claim. <coughs> the lieutenant and his troops departed the next morning. On the evening of their second day on patrol, they overtook the band of Apaches that had gone on the warpath. <coughs> Excuse me. In the heat of battle, Frank Sutter became separated from the rest of his men. When the dust had settled and the Indians had scattered into the dusk, the troops searched vainly for the young lieutenant. But he had vanished. When they could turn up no trace of him, they returned to Fort Union and reported him missing in action. Dr. Zadium, that's not creepy at all. Oh, no, it's not creepy in the slightest. Excuse <coughs> me, again. Other people at the fort noted, and not very kindly, that Elizabeth Bidwell, Frank Sutter's bride-elect, grieved very little for the missing bridegroom-to-be. And it came as no great surprise to anyone when she announced her intention of marrying a man recently arrived from the East, who would take her back to St. Louis, Louis with him. Her sister and brother-in-law arranged a wedding for her on the post. When the big day arrived, there was a short ceremony in the chapel. Then everyone retired in the evening to the mess hall, which was decorated for a ball. Dr. Zadium, old oh boy. <laughs> Outside, a sudden thunderstorm rolled through nearby canyons and sent rain splattering against the roof and walls of the mess hall. But inside, all was festivity. There was good food, lots to drink, and loud laughter everywhere. A band was playing with more enthusiasm than tunefulness, but everyone was having a fine time. At the heart of everything, was Elizabeth Bidwell, smiling and fanning herself, and swirling her skirts of rose blush pink. Suddenly, when the dance was in full swing, the outside doors of the hall slammed open with a bang, letting in a drought of draft of air that made the candles gutter and burn low. A 
blood-curdling cry, neither human nor like any other bird or creature anyone could name, echoed through the common room, carried on the invading wind. All eyes turned to the open doorway. Framed by the doorpost was the body of a dead man, dressed in the stained uniform of a cavalry officer. Across his forehead was a gash left by a tomahawk. His eyes were wide open and burned with a fiery light. As everyone retreated to the edges of the dance floor, the horrible apparition walked across the floor to the new bride and pulled her from the arms of her husband. Like the rest of the company, she stood gaping, too shocked to move. The corpse led Elizabeth to the center of the floor. She moved as stiffly as a doll, her mouth working but no sound coming out. Suddenly, the thing that had been Lieutenant Sutter clasped the young woman closely to her. Then he gave a signal to the musicians. <coughs> Afterward, the shaken men protested that they did not know what they were doing, but at the corpse's command, they began to play a waltz so strange and haunting in its melody that some people burst into tears upon hearing it, while others pressed their hands to their ears to keep out the sound. On the floor, the couple whirled around and around and around. Elizabeth could not take her gaze from the dead lieutenant's burning eyes, but she grew paler and paler. The musicians, possessed by some compulsion from beyond the grave, played faster and faster until the music became so frantic that the spinning couple that the spinning couple out on the floor became a blur of pink skirts and blue uniform. Private Maverick, yeah, a dirge. Then the music slowed from a pace that no human could dance to back to a waltz, and down to a dirge. The young woman hung limply in the corpse's arms. Her slack jaw and empty eyes showed that she was as je dead as her partner. Gently, the dead man lowered her body to the floor. For a moment, he stood staring down at her. Then his eyes circled the horrified company. He threw back his head and gave the same fearful cry they had heard earlier. Then he turned and marched stiffly out into the driving wind and rain, while the doors of the mess hall slammed shut behind him. When people could move again, Elizabeth's bridegroom rushed to her side, but his efforts to revive her were futile. The corpse had vanished into the storm that battered Fort Union for a day and night. Several days later, a troop of soldiers that had been sent to the scene of the earlier battle located Frank Sutter's body where it lay at the bottom of a small gully, with a single tomahawk gash across the forehead. He was returned to the post, and buried beside Elizabeth Bidwell, in the little cemetery, outside the fort. Oh my goodness. Oh, hoo, hoo, hoo. interesting, isn't it? Dr. Zane, that was good. Oh, yes, yes. I, ironically enough, this story was actually featured in a television series. A st in a, um, this, I believe the series was One Step Beyond, a very old series. Let me see, what's our next story we should tell? Hmm. 
I don't remember the stories I told last time, so if I repeat some, I apologize. Would you mind if I repeated some stories from last time? Yulian 20, that's okay. Well, let me go to the next book and see if there are any stories here I can tell. I've got two books here. I don't think I did this one. This story is from Papua New Guinea, and it's entitled The Headrest. In the old days, it happened that Ine, a man from the hills, came to a certain village, leading his little son by the hand. He spent the day trading with the villagers and talking with them. His boy, Mimao, sat beside him, silent and smiling shyly. People remarked what a well-behaved child he was, a blessing to his father and mother. The women kindly gave father and son taro, bananas, plantains, and sugar cane to eat. When darkness fell, the stranger went into the Patuma, the common house, where the men slept, to spend the night. He took his son with him. But in the Batuma was Kakak, a man of the village who was short-tempered and violent. When he saw the hillman's child about to fall asleep beside his father, Kakak raised a great cry. While two of Kakak's friends held the hillman in check, the angry villager shook Mimao. What are you doing here, boy? He cried. Don't you know that this is a house for men? Go away at once. Then Kakak beat the little child and shoved him out of the door into the dirt beyond. The boy lay still. His spirit had fled his body. Ine also was expelled from the Batuma. When he saw the lifeless form of his son, he gave a cry that echoed from the distant hills. Then wordlessly, he, he gathered the body of his little Mamau in his arms and walked away into the night. At this, Kakao boasted, this is how I will deal with all strangers who do not respect our customs. Then contented, he lay down to sleep. Only a few days after this, it happened that all the people of the village were fishing at the river. So no one noticed Ine creep into the empty Patuma. When the hillman entered, he carried something in his hands. But when he left, his hands were empty. Still unseen, Ine hurried back to the hills. <coughs> At evening, the men of the village returned. After they had eaten, they went into the Patuma and made ready to sleep, for they were weary after a day spent fishing. In the center of the sleeping place, Kakak saw a headrest carved of wood. Instantly, he claimed it for his own, saying, This is my pillow. If any of you wish it, you must take it from me in a wrestling match, if you dare. But the other men, knowing his fierceness and strength, refused to wrestle with him. They just shrugged and let him be. Then Kakak lay down, rested his neck on the carved wooden headrest, 
and was soon asleep. In the morning, the men awoke, stretched, and one by one came out of the Potuma into the village. But Kakak was not among them. It surprised the others that he was still sleeping, for he was usually the first to arise. After a time, one man went in and tried to rouse the fierce man. But when he looked closely, he saw that Kakak was dead. Then he made a great outcry, calling to the other men. When they saw the body, the men were very much afraid. How could he have died so quickly and quietly? They asked each other. Surely he was bewitched. Kakak was buried and his name was no longer spoken aloud, as was the custom when someone died. But the man who had first tried to wake him took the headrest from for himself. It chanced that he was one of the two who had held back the hill man while Kakak beat his child. That night he lay down to sleep, and in the morning he was also found dead. What evil comes into the Batum at night that kills men so swiftly? The villagers wondered fearfully. Let us watch all through the night to see what shape our enemy takes. Well, hello de there, Densua. Welcome. We're in the middle of telling some spooky stories. <coughs> Excuse me. Dr. Zadium. Of course they couldn't say that man's name again. It would get them demonetized on YouTube. Yeah. So the men sat up all through the night, but they saw nothing. In the morning they went wearily about their business, unsure whether the evil had truly gone away, or was merely waiting to strike again, when they might be less watchful. In the warmth of the afternoon one man crept back to the Patuma to sleep, while all his fellows were fishing. As it happened, this was the second of the two men who had held the hill man while his child was beaten. Seeing the head rest in a corner, he placed it under his neck, sighed contently, and was soon fast asleep. Now his fellows, noticing he was gone from the riverbank, sent a boy to fetch him. Excuse <coughs> me. The child had just reached the entrance of the Batuma when he saw the headrest slide out from under the sleeping man, fly into the air, then fall with great force on the sleeper's head. The man lay dead upon the ground with the headrest beside him, before the child could so much as cry out a warning. Fearful that the thing might fall on his own head, the boy ran back to the river, shouting to tell everyone what he had seen. For a long time, the men remained outside the common house, staring at the slain man's body, and the headrest beside it. After much discussion, they gathered as much wood as possible and built a great fire in the open space outside the Patuma. Then the strongest and bravest man went inside and picked up the headrest. To the touch, it seemed nothing more than ordinary wood. But when he neared the bonfire, the headrest began to twist about in his grip as though it would break free. With a cry partially of fear and partially of disgust, the man cast the headrest into the hottest part of the flames. Instantly, the wood caught fire. And as the villagers watched aghast, it writhed and crawled about the pyre as if it were truly alive. 
All the while, it groaned. Hack, 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 and screamed. Hack, 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 until it was burned to ashes. Then, from the heart of the dying fire, arose a whirlwind. It carried the ashes of the headrest high into the air. There, other winds caught them and carried them across the river and over the trees toward the distant hills and a village high in the mountains. They would be assigned to Ine, watching silently from the door of his hut, that vengeance had been exacted for the violence done to his little son. <laughs> ah, interesting tale, isn't it, my dear scholars? Hmm. Though in this case, the headrest was being used not as a tool of evil, necessarily, but a tool of vengeance. Fascinating, isn't it? Let me see. Let us see our next tale. How about a story that's a bit of an urban legend? Something that's a bit more modern, if you will. Let me see. This tale is one that I'm sure some of you have heard in some form or another. And it's entitled, Knock, Knock, Knock. You're wearing that to a costume party? exclaimed Nicole. That's not a costume. I'm going as a jogger, said Mark. You jog every day. That's only your old gray running suit. So, it's authentic, Mark said. Anyhow, I didn't have time to come up with a real costume. You could have rented one, Nicole pointed out. I'm not was wasting my hard-earned college money on a giant bunny outfit, he said. Besides, you're uh, dressed up enough for both of us. I'm Queen Guinevere, she exclaimed. She explained, You know, she married Queen Arthur? Yeah, I saw the movie on TV, Mark said. Um, um Nick... Just to put you on yellow alert, my car has been giving me a little trouble. Nicole sighed. Will it get us there? 98% uh, certainty. And back, she wondered. Then added quickly, Don't give me the odds. Just get us there. We'll work the rest out later. <laughs> you got it, Mark said, offering her his arm. Queen Guinevere? Your Toyota awaits. <laughs> Lancelot, you're not, she said laughing. But you do look pretty good, even in a grungy jogging suit. Private Maverick Candyman, oh, you'll see. However, Nicole's high spirits soon evaporated. Mark's car managed nearly to stall out at every stop sign or intersection. Are you sure we'll get to the country club? She asked anxiously. Yeah, I'm sure. Mark snapped as the engine sputtered and the car shuddered. Nicole held her breath. But the problem seemed to correct itself. It wasn't just the car that made her jittery. A heavy fog had settled over the lonely, twisting country road. Relax. Put on some music. Mark suggested, adding quickly. Um, 
on the radio, the cassette player is broken. Nicole almost said something about what bad shape everything was in, but she decided not to risk an argument. As the hills grew higher, the music stations faded into static. All she could get was a news station. A little bit of water for this. Great, she said, making a face. Then she paused, listening intently as the radio announced. Warning, everybody. Yeah, I'm getting my radio voice. Yeah. Warning. Everyone in the Norris Valley, Valley area, that convicted killer Owen Helms, the so-called Hangman, has escaped from the criminal asylum at Pinecrest. That's just at the other end of the valley, cried Nicole. She was going to insist that Mark turn the car around when two things happened. The radio program dissolved into crackling static, and the car bucked twice and died. Mark used what momentum was left to steer the Toyota to the side of the road. They came to a stop under a tree. Condensed fog dripped from an overhanging branch. Thunk. 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 Helium 20. Oh, I know this story. Oh, you do! Well, keep... Don't, don't spoil it for all the rest of the scholars. <coughs> Mark turned the ignition key several times, but all the engine would do was gurgle and chuff. Soon even these noises grew weaker. The car refused to start. Finally, Nicole said, Give it a rest! You're just draining the battery! Mark slammed his fist against the steering wheel. Then he climbed down and lifted the hood and fiddled with the engine. Try it now! He'd call every few minutes. But when Nicole turned the key, all she got were clicks. In between, she tried to get some more news on the escaped killer. But the radio just gave off creepy sounds like whispers. So she snapped it off. I'm going to have to go and get help. Lucky I wore my jog togs and nikes after all. I think we're just a few miles from the country club. I'll call a toll truck from there. And have someone bring me back here. Shouldn't be gone more than half an hour or so. No way am I staying out here by myself, said Nicole. Not with the happy Hainman on the loose. Be reasonable, Nick. How are you going to jog in that costume of yours? And I'm not about to go for a stroll through this freezing fog. No, Mark, please. Look, Nick, if you're really worried... Crouch down on the floor in back under that old blanket. Now, if anyone comes along, they'll think the car is empty. But no one will bother you. I promise, I swear to it. You also promised to get us to the party, she said. But she was more scared than angry. All right, all right. But I swear I'm not coming out from under that blanket until I'm sure it's you here. I'm going to leave you the keys for safekeeping. When I get back... Oh, thank you for the raid, Steph Sue. Welcome, raiders! We're in the middle, middle of reading some spooky stories. We're reading a little bit of an urban legend this time. Hello there! What were you all doing, Steph Sue? Were you having some fun on this spooky holiday? Let me give a shout out to you. There we go. What were you doing, Steph Sue? Were you streaming? Were you streaming a game, reading? What ha What was it? I'm curious. Steph Sue, continue more of Jane Eyre. We're finally on chapter 25. Excellent. I have never read that story. I think... Have I heard that story before? Maybe I have. My memory is bad. But, uh, wonderful! Glad to have you here, all you wonderful s raiders. We are reading, uh, some spooky stories. And we're in the middle of a urban legend. So sit back, all you raiders. Relax. 
have a hot or cold beverage. So I was in here last week, met you and quite a few others on the Google Doc you all shared. Oh, yes, I remember. I remember you. I remember you being here. And I much appreciate it. Ah, oh, yes. Thank you for introducing me to other reasons. Oh, I can't take full credit. I think I think Kinshawn, who comes here often, also um, helped with that. Did most of the work. I yeah, can't talk. Um, Kinshawn, I believe, is the one who, behind the documents, so he did most of the work. I merely, I, I, I merely hosted him here, so he deserves a lot of the credit. Now, where were we? <coughs> I'm going to leave you the keys for safekeeping. When I get back, I'll knock three times, like this. He went. Knock. 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 On the roof of the car, just above the door on the driver's side. Now don't come out until you hear that signal. I won't, she said. Believe me. He kissed her goodbye, watched while she locked and tested both doors, then waved as he jogged away into the fog. The minute he was out of sight, she climbed into the back seat, bunched up in the narrow space, and arranged the musty old blanket over herself. Steph Sue, glad to get to catch your stream again. I'll cook some dinner and be lurking. All right. We won't be reading all night. We'll be doing a few, one other thing tonight. So uh, I hope you'll enjoy that as well. How long she remained there, Nicole wasn't sure. When her legs began to cramp, she brought her watch up to her face without disturbing the blanket and read the illuminated dial. Less than half an hour had passed, but it felt more like years. Suddenly, she heard a knock on the roof of the car. Mark! Mark! She whispered. She was about to throw off the blanket when she remembered he promised to knock three times. She had a sudden, sickening feeling that someone else was outside, maybe trying to find a way into the locked car. Please! Please! Knock again! She whispered, Make it be Mark. Knock. One more. One more. Please. Please, just one more. Knock. She almost laughed out loud with relief. Knock. Her blood turned to ice water. Knock. 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 She froze, hardly daring to breathe as the knocks continued on and on, spaced just about the same. Each one was like a fist in her stomach. At first, she was sure that the hangman was trying to get in. Then she imagined that he was so wacko that he was just beating on the car like a child pounding endlessly on a toy drum. Finally, she wondered if he knew she was inside and was tormenting her until he smashed a window. Knock. 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 Please... Please, please, someone, come help me, she prayed. Knock. Knock. Then she heard the sound of heavy boots crunching on the gravel. 
voices and a radio with a dispatcher's voice giving instructions that she couldn't make out. Knock. Then merciless, mercifully, merciless, then merciless, then it stopped. Mark must have come. Or the tow truck. Nicole sat up and looked out the window and screamed. Two men were staring in at her. After a terrifying, confused moment, she realized that they were police. Behind them, she saw the spinning blue and red lights on top of their police car. It's okay, young lady, the first officer said. You can come out now. Her shaking hand found the lock release. She climbed unsteadily out. Where's Mark? She asked, looking around. D didn't he come with you? Come to the patrol car, said the second officer. Don't look back. Just keep your eyes on the patrol car. Why, why, why can't I look? Nicole asked. She turned suddenly and saw Mark's body still in the gray jogging outfit hanging from the tree limb above the car. Hey! yelled the officer. You don't want to see that, this miss. Come on. As he reached around to grab her, grab her, the body started swinging. Nicole watched in horror as one Nike-clad foot began to beat against the roof of the car. So that was a bit of an urban legend. A little bit more recent than other stories, you know. And it's it's a story that, of course, has an incredible amount of variations. Always told from someone who heard it from someone else. That sort of tale. Alien 20, that was horrifying. Of course it was horrifying. It's supposed to be fine. So, ooh, that was... It was still a good story. Yes, yes! And, of course, there's multiple different urban legends all across years. I mean, of course, everyone's heard of the hooked hand story, which is a very famous one. Okay, let's go back to the first book. Let's see what we can find there. I'm saving a good story for last. Let me see here. So this one I might have read before. Which one do I want to do next? Yeah, I think I read this one before, so we're going to skip that one. And we are going to do... Let's do a here's a here's a famous one. That I'm sure some of you may have heard. This story is called The King of Cats from England. It's an English tale. <coughs> If you all have cats with you, 
my dear scholars, keep an eye on them with this story. <laughs> on a chilly winter's evening, a grave digger's wife sat by the fireside, waiting for her husband to come home. Across from her sat her big black cat, Old Tom, who was half asleep like his mistress. Wherever can the, can the man be? I'm trying to get... Hold on, I gotta get this accent. Wherever can the man be? The woman asked. Meow. Said old Tom, stretching his legs. So they waited. And they waited. Suddenly, both jumped to hear footsteps pounding up the path. A minute later, the gravedigger, all out of breath, came rushing into the room. Here's Tom Teardrum! He shouted in such a wild way that both his wife and his cat stared at him in surprise. Why, what's the matter? asked his wife. And what do you want to know who Tom Teardrum is? The gravedigger caught his breath and pulled a chair up to the fire. What an adventure I've had! There I was, digging away at old Mr. Fordyce's grave. Hard work it was. So I paused for a rest, sitting in the hall itself, where the wind couldn't reach me. I suppose I dropped off to sleep. How long I remained, so I can't say. But I woke up when I heard a cat's meow. Meow! <coughs> said old Tom in answer. Yes, just like that. Devon Bear with Melfus. Hi, from Steph Sue's stream. I couldn't be part of the raid, but I'm here. Oh, thank you for the follow. Oh, welcome to our little group of scholars. I'm Matsu Quinox, Interdimensional Omniversal Librarian. This is Horace, and welcome. We are in the middle of reading some spooky stories. And then we're going to watch a movie. <laughs> Glad to have you here. Yes, just like that. So I peeped over the edge of the grave. And what do you think I saw? Now, how could I know that? His wife said. Get on with the telling. Indeed, I saw nine black cats that looked for all the world like old Tom here, said her husband. Each had a white spot on his chest. Just like him. And what do you think they were carrying? He asked his wife. You might as well ask old Tom as ask me, said his wife, who was growing impatient, since we were, since we were both as fast sitting by the fire. Well, those cats were walking upright, and eight of them were carrying a little coffin on their shoulders. It was covered with a black velvet cloth, the cloth was all bordered in little grilled crowns. The ninth cat, bigger than the others, walked in front. On every third step, he would call out, Meow! And then the others would all answer together, Meow! Meow! Wailed old Tom again. Yeah, just like that! exclaimed the grave digger. And as they came nearer and nearer to me, I could see them even more clearly, because their eyes seemed to shine with a strange green light. Well, they all came toward me, and the leader looked for all the world that... But look at our Tom! The man said, pointing a finger at the cat on the hearth. See how he's staring at me? You'd think he understood every word I was saying. Go on, go on, said his wife. Never mind, old Tom! Well, as I was saying, the grave digger continued, those cats came slowly towards me, marching as solemnly as proper mourners, and every third step crying out, Meow! in answer to the leader's own, Meow! Meow! bawled old Tom again. Yes, yes, just like that! the man said with a nod. On they came, until they stood alongside Mr. Fordyce's grave. Then they stood still and stared right at me. Made me feel all that it did. 
was an arm, pale, glowing green eyes peering at me. Then the man looked at his own cat and said, But look at old Tom! He's staring at me just the way they did. And bless me, but there seems to be more green in his eyes than I've ever seen before. Uh, go on, go on, said his wife. Finish the story, and never mind old Tom. Where was I? Oh, yeah, said the man. Oh, yes, I recall now. Those nine big cats just stood still looking at me. Then the one that wasn't carrying the coffin came forward, stood on the edge of the grave gazing down at me, and said, Are you saying that the cat spoke to you? His wife asked, shaking her head in disbelief. Now it was her husband's turn to grow impatient. Yes, I swear to you, he said to me in a squeaky voice, Tell Tom Tildrum that Tim Toldrum is dead. I was so unnerved, I ran for the churchyard that very minute. That's why, when I first came in here, I asked you if you know who Tom Tildrum is. How can I tell Tom Tildrum that Tim Tildrum, Tildrum is dead? If I don't know for the life of me, know who Tom Tildrum is. But his wife suddenly shouted, Look at old Tom! Look at old Tom! Then the both of them gaped, for old Tom seemed to grow to twice his normal size, while his eyes blazed with a terrible green light. He shrieked out, what? Oh, Tom dead? Then I'm king of the cats! With a howl of triumph, he rushed up the chimney and was never more seen by the gravedigger or his wife. So all you dear scholars who have cats... Keep an eye on them. Some day they may inherit the throne of the king or queen of the cats. And then what are you gonna do? Nearly in twenty. Meow. Kintron Kit or treat Oh welcome, Kintron, welcome. Glad to have you here. We are Telling some spooky stories. And then we are going to take a break and then we're going to watch a movie. And since you are here, Kintron, how about one involving a wolf? Well, a sort of wolf. This story is from French Canada and is entitled The Loop. Garou. In the old time in Canada, people believed the werewolf, which they called the Loup Garou, haunted graveyards and prowled the woods and waited in the brush beside lonely trails to catch unweary travelers and gobble them up. <coughs> There was an old couple living on a farm far out in the country. One wintry night, Martha took very ill, and her husband, Pierre, had to go to fetch the doctor in town. But this meant a long, long journey into the woods. But Pierre was too worried about his wife to hesitate. He hitched up his horse to his sleigh and set out through the lightly falling snow. As he went along, he could hear nothing except the scrunch, scrunch, scrunch of snow under the sleigh's runners and the horse's hooves. The old man wasn't thinking of anything except getting help from Martha as fast as he could. They were now a long way into the woods, 
Moonlight shone on the snow, which lay thick on the ground and on branches of the pine trees all around. Sometimes from deep in the shadows would come the sharp report of an ice-heavy branch snapping and dropping to the ground. Once Pierre heard an owl hooting. Except for these sounds, silence lay heavily over the forest. The road ahead was level and easy enough for, a, for the horse, but suddenly the animal began to slow down. Pierre shook the reins and shouted, Gee up! But the horse was hardly moving at all now. It was as if he was pulling a two-ton load rather than the little sleigh with a single passenger. The old man flicked his whip, but the horse merely shook its head and made a frightened little whinny. The poor animal was breathing rapidly, its warm breath making clouds like the steam from a steamboat's chimney. Sweat was running down his flank. Now Pierre could feel some of the horse's fear sinking into him. Then there was a low growl just behind him that stood his hair on end. Turning, he discovered what looked like a great, big, black dog or wolf. Its teeth and the claws of its forepaws sunk into the back of the sleigh, its hind paws dragging on the ground, bringing the sled nearly to a halt. <coughs> For one terrible moment, Pierre stared directly into the creature's burning yellow eyes. Then, almost without thinking, he cracked his whip across the monster's snout. The wolf gave a howl of pain and loosened its hold on the sleigh for a moment. In that instant, the horse lunged forward and ran as if all the devils from hell were in pursuit. Looking over his shoulder, Pierre could see the shadowy creature bounding down the road close behind. The man knew that unless his guardian angel was riding with him that night, it was all over for him. He didn't need to urge the horse to go faster. The animal was so scared that he galloped like a hurricane. But for all that, the monster was getting closer and closer, and the creature gave a tremendous leap and landed on the back of the sleigh. The thump of the impact and the sudden weight on the end of the sleigh sent it sliding first to one side of the road, then the other. For a moment, Pierre thought he was going to crash. But miraculously, the sleigh kept upright on its runners and found the center of the road again. The horse, now crazy with fear, somehow managed to keep from falling in the icy road, often blocked with drafts of snow. The wolf was growling as it crept toward the old man who had, his, who had turned to face the beast. Pierre tried using his whip again, but the monster caught it in its huge jaws, severing it as if it were no more than a twig, and tossing it over the edge of the wildly careening sleigh. <coughs> Old Pierre felt for his hunting knife and pulled it free, just as the wolf sprang to at it. Yeah. Just as the wolf sprang at him and slammed the man to the bottom of the sleigh. His forepaws were on Pierre's shoulders, pinning him to the floorboards. The man felt his bones were likely to break under the weight of the monster. For one terrible instant, he felt the creature's whiskers brush his face like needles, felt its hot breath on his throat, saw its yellow eyes only inches from his own. Then, with a prayer, he jabbed at the thing with his hunting knife. Though the movement was hampered by the weight of the monster on top of him, he managed to nick it just enough to draw blood, so a spot of red appeared on its pelt. Instantly, the creature reared back, howling like nothing Pierre had ever heard before. Then, to the old man's astonishment, the wolf turned into a man. 
Right away, Pierre knew that this was indeed a loop guru, because the stories say that if you draw blood from the loop guru, he'll turn back to a man right off and run away. Pressing his big, pale hand to his side, the man suddenly leapt off the sleigh. Pierre saw him rolling down a hillside through the snow, where the forest shadows quickly hid him. Then the sleigh was out of the woods and heading toward the sleeping town ahead. Shaking, Pierre returned his knife to its holster and took hold of the reins, gradually easing the horse back to a trot, saying, Easy! Easy! When they reached the gate of the doctor's house, Pierre quickly roused the man who thought at first the old man was the one who was sick because he was so pale and trembling. But when Pierre told what had happened, the doctor gave him a shot of whiskey. Then they roused the village priest who gave them holy water and a cross as protection for their journey back through the woods. Pierre never saw the loop guru again. But Martha, when she recovered, made him promise never to travel through the woods alone at night again. And the old man was only too happy to give her his word that he never would. I see. Million twenty like Johnny Quest. Yes, it was featured in an episode of Johnny Quest, I believe. Dr. Say, my kitty is already a queen. Well, every kitty is a queen or king to their owners. Private Maverick, at least there aren't nasty rats. Private Maverick, if it bleeds, it can be killed. Hmm. Well, Private Maverick, um, because you said that, the next story is going to be for you. And let's see what page was it on. I'm dedicating this next story to Private Maverick because he had to say that. This next story is from Germany and it is entitled The Mouse Tower. In the middle of the Rhine River, near the city of B Bingen, there has stood for hundreds of years a fortified rock topped by a large tower called the Mausturm, or Mouse Tower. Legend has long held that this was the scene of a terrible punishment sent by God upon a bishop who betrayed the faithful in his care. In the year 970, Germany suffered from a terrible famine. In desperation, people were reduced to eating dogs and cats, and still countless numbers died of hunger. At this time, Hato II was bishop of the region. Every day, the starving poor would crowd around his door, begging for bread. It was widely known that he had plentiful supplies of grain set aside from the good harvest the year before. But the bishop refused to part with the mounds of grain locked away in his bulging storehouses. His only thought was to increase his personal fortune. Oh no, Private Mac, not that quote. I'm talking about at least there weren't nasty rats. <coughs> From the high window of his palace, he would watch poor people fainting from hunger on the streets and storming the bread market where they would take the bread by force. The bishop felt no pity at all for these starving people, but he soon grew weary of their cries day and night as they crowded around his palace walls, begging for a crust of bread, a handful of corn. At last, the bishop decided to quiet the mob. From his window, he announced to them, let all your poor and needy gather in my great barn outside the city. There I shall feed you. Mm -hmm. 
So it was that from all directions, from near and far, a desperate army of hungry folk flocked to the bishop's barn. Loudly they sang the bishop's praises while his soldiers urged them into the barn. When the vast wooden structure could hold no more, the treacherous bishop ordered his soldiers to seal the doors. Then he had his men set fire to the barn and burn the unfortunates, young and old, men and women. Firefly, will he feed them to something? Not exactly. Well, technically he did. When the flames were at their highest and the agonized cries were loudest, Hato said, Hear, hear! How the mice squeak! In faith, tis an excellent bonfire. The country is greatly obliged to me for ridding it of such mice who would only consume our precious corn. The shouts and screams for mercy seemed to hang in the air long after the barn was reduced to nothing more than smoking embers. Afterward, content with his day's work, the wicked man returned to his palace. There he sat down merrily to supper, and afterwards slept the night like an innocent man. But God soon saw to it that Bishop Hatto never slept again. America, there's going to be a spot warming up for the bishop. The next more, the very next morning, the bishop discovered his palace was infested with mice. They scurried down corridors and crawled over his feet while he took his ease or tried to read. They fouled the food in his larder and chewed his books and papers. They bit anyone who tried to drive them away. No efforts on his part would free Bishop Hatto from their torments. When he entered his great hall, he discovered that the mice had eaten his portrait out of its frame. The rectangle of splintered wood held only a few tatters of canvas. A short time later, a frightened farm servant reported to him that mice had devoured all the corn in his granaries. Kinshaw, no chewing books. Yes, no chewing books. That is bad. That is a bad thing to do. <coughs> Immediately thereafter, a second terrified messenger arrived and reported that a huge tide of mice was scurrying towards his palace. Rushing to his window, the bishop could see the roads and fields dark with the advancing army. The vast horde of mice were chewing remorselessly through both hedge and wall as the creatures made straight for the palace. The sound of their shrieking and squeaking chilled him to the heart. Full of terror, Bishop Hatto escaped through the rear gate and commanded his men to row him out to his tower in the middle of the Rhine River. There he ordered his servants to bar every entrance. But the mice followed him. They swam across the river and clambered up the rock and crawled through every crack and crevice of the battlements. Swarming over the tower, they chewed their way in by the thousands through oaken doors and plank floors and wooden ceilings. And when they had cornered the wick wicked bishop, they climbed, dropped, and leapt upon him from all sides. As one old poem has it, they wetted their teeth against the stones, and when then they picked the bishop's bones. 
they gnawed the flesh from every limb, for they were sent to punish him. And as suddenly as they had appeared, the swarms of mice disappeared. Many people were convinced that the animals were really the souls of those the bishop had so cruelly slain. The mouse term remains a place of fearful fascination. It is rumored that one can still hear the ghostly cries of the wretched bishop and the chittering of hordes of unseen mice on the anniversary of the fatal barn fire. Private <laughs> Mark, ooh, I get it now. The birth of the scaven rat folk. <laughs> you in 20. OMG, I am ready for the movie now. Not quite. I'm going to tell one more short story before we take a break and then go to the movie. This is what's going to require me a lot of water. Because there's a voice in it that will hurt the throat. We're going to close out our evening. Evening's reading tonight. With one more tale. One of my personal favorites to do. Well, thank you for the posture check and thank you for the hydrate, Kintron. This story comes from West Virginia. And it is entitled Taily Poe. Not so very long ago, an old man lived by himself in the backwoods of West Virginia. He had a log cabin with a single room that held a stove, a bed, a table, a chair, and a big open fireplace built of field stone. <laughs> One night, the man sat eating a plate full of beans and bread and regretting that he hadn't been able to catch a single fish in the lake behind his cabin or bag a single possum or deer for his supper. He was startled to look across the table and see the strangest creature he had ever seen sitting on its haunches in the far corner of the room staring at him. It had jaws like a weasel ears like a fox piercing yellow eyes like an owl and a monkey's body, and was covered in bright red fur. But mainly, it had a huge, long tail that coiled around and around it the way a rattler coils on itself before it strikes. What the? cried the man. How'd you get in here? He grabbed his carving knife from beside the loaf of bread and went after the animal. The thing gave a screech like nothing the man had heard before. Then it scrambled out through a chink between two of the cabin's logs. But it wasn't quick enough. With a single slice, the man cut the creature's tail off while the rest of the animals scampered away to the woods. The man walked back to the table and stretched out the tail, marveling at its length. After a few minutes, he decided that meat was meat, and that was what he was hungry for right now. So he cooked up that tail, found it tasted a little like rabbit, and ate it all in one sitting. After that, he plugged up the hole between the logs, went to bed, and soon was fast asleep. He hadn't been asleep very long. 
and you heard something scratching at the door. Just like a cat. Pretty soon he heard it call Telepo Telepo Just give me my Telepo Now he had three dogs that slept under the house. He whistled for them and they came charging out and chased the creature far into the woods. But only two of his dogs came back. When the man saw this, he cursed the blue streak. Then he sent the dogs to sleep under the floorboards and went back to bed himself. A short time later, he heard the same clawing at the front door th as the creature tried to get in. Then he heard a call through a crack in the door. Telepo, Telepo, just give me my Telepo. Once again, the man whistled up his dogs from underneath the cabin, and they chased the creature all the way down the road, snapping so close behind that if it still had a tail, it would have lost it to the hounds. The man heard the dogs giving chase until the woods swallowed up the sound. But a little later, only one dog returned. Again the man cursed loudly. This time he had his remaining dog sleep at the foot of his bed. In the smallest hours of the morning, he heard something scrabbling at the door, like a nightbird trying to get in. Through the cracked glass, he heard, Telepo, Telepo, I've got to have my Telepo. Quick as he could, he flung the cabin door open and sent his last dog out into the night. He heard the dog charging around the corner of the cabin and heard the creature screeching and scrambling away. After that, things were pretty quiet. But the last hound never did return. The man stayed awake a long time, listening, but he heard nothing more. Finally, just before dawn, he fell asleep. But he woke up a few minutes later. He was sure he heard something in his room. He looked into the far corner and saw the patch he'd put over the hole was gone. Then he heard something scrambling up the foot of his bed. A minute later, he saw a fox's ears, a weasel's jaws, and two huge yellow eyes 
just like an owl's, looking at him. He tried calling for his dogs, but they were gone. He was too frightened to climb out of bed. He just kept staring, while the red monkey-like creature kept crept closer and closer. Derlipo! Derlipo! It growled. Just give me my Derlipo. Ma, ma, ma. The man stuttered. I haven't got your Lipo. Then the horrible creature, which was by then sitting on the man's knees, snarled and said, Oh, yes. And it jumped on the man's chest and scratched him all to pieces. There are those who say that the creature got its taily pole back, and some who say it didn't. But the fact is, that old man and his dogs were never seen again in West Virginia or anywhere else. And that was Taylor Poe. That one always does a number on my vocal cords. Oh my goodness. So that is our scary stories for this spooky evening. So what we're going to do, my dear scholars, we are going to take a little intermission. And when we get back, we are going to sit down and we are going to watch a very special movie presentation of Plan 9 from Outer Space. I'll see you in just a few moments. <laughs>
Hello there, my dear, wonderful, marvelous, amazing scholars. I hope you all uh, are still here with us. How are you all doing? Did you enjoy those spooky stories? I hope you enjoyed the spooky stories. <laughs> I forgot I had... Do I have... I gotta do it. The only 20... Oh, yes. Good, good. Um, yes, so tonight, we are actually going to watch a movie. Ah, ha, ha. I love movie showings. It's always so exciting. So uh, tonight, we are going to be watching a special film just for Halloween. It's in the public domain because... Uh, it uh, failed to provide a copyright when it was released. And the copyright was never updated. Mm -hmm. um, but we are going to watch Ed Wood's Plan 9 from Outer Space. Um, how many of you, dear scholars, have ever seen this film? Show of hands. Anyone seen this movie? Um, if you haven't... Doing 20 many times, Dr. Zanium, I have... Oh, okay, okay. So you know what you're in for. Um, if you haven't, you're in for a special treat, Dr. Zanium, the original and the Rift Text. Oh, nice, nice, nice. Um, th this doesn't have... This, this is the original, um, though I might end up inadvertently riffing on it as we watch. Um, can't help myself. Um, but this is the original. It was made in 19... Oh, is it 59, 58? It was late in the 50s, which is unusual because it's a film that really doesn't feel like it should be then. Um, it had a ho very small budget, and there's a lot of interesting little behind-the-scenes stories before that. Um, it is infamous. It was sometimes cited as one of the worst films ever made, though I don't think it really is. But, um, yes. So, my dear scholars, are you ready? To enjoy this cinematic master... Well, I can't say it, masterpiece. This cinematic ground... Well, it's not really groundbreaking. This movie. We'll just put up this movie. Yes. All right, then. So sit back, relax. Get yourself some popcorn. Or some treats. Get yourself some concessions. And we are going to begin our watch of... Plan 9. From outer space. 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 I don't know why I'm saying it like that. <laughs> Doctor Savior, it was one of the movies of all time. Yes, it was. Hopefully, it's gonna work. Here we go. <laughs> Greetings, my friend. We are all interested in the future, for that is where you and I are going to spend the rest of our lives. I think that's uh, uh, And remember, my friend, future events such as these will affect you in the future. <laughs> you are interested in the unknown. Yes. The mysterious. Yes. The unexplainable. Maybe. That is why you are here. Are we? And now, for the first time, we are bringing to you the full story of what happened on that fateful day. Really? We are giving you all the evidence based only on the secret testimony of the miserable souls who survived this terrifying ordeal. It's terrifying? The incidents, the places. My friend, we cannot keep this a secret any longer. Let us punish the guilty. Let us reward the innocent. Wait, what? My friend, can your heart stand can the it? shocking facts about Grave Robbers from Outer Space. Whoa! That was actually the original title of this movie. It was Grave Robbers from Outer Space. I don't know why they changed it. I'm not sure you know. If I say that, that's a pun. I can't say it.
that's not a good sign. When a film is written... Just, oh my goodness, I forgot to process. All of us on this earth know that there is a time to live and that there is a time to die. Obviously. Yet death is always a shock to those left behind. It is even Look, more of a shock oh. when death, the proud brother, comes suddenly without warning. Just at sundown, a small group gathered in Bella silent Gose's prayer around the newly opened and, grave oh, of the beloved man. wife of an elderly man. Sundown of the day, yet also the sundown of the old man's heart. For the shadows of grief clouded his very reason. Thank you, narrator. We needed to uh, know that, obviously. Doing 20 Dracula. Well, uh, long past. The it. funeral over, the saddened group left the graveside. So, this is daytime, obviously, I think. It was when the gravediggers started their task that strange things began to take place. Oh, 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 oh. here we are. Fifteen to four. <laughs> yep, right on schedule. There's the old San Fernando Valley out there now. You better ready I'm the sorry. instructions, Danny. Right, Jeff? Yeah. Burbank Tower, this is American Flight 812. Well, they probably better job Over. flying this plane if Wouldn't they surprise me didn't if have sleep this cardboard in, in front of them. American Flight 812, this is Burbank Tower. If I were asleep, you'd never get on the ground. In your case, maybe I'd leave so you up there that for behind? good. What's that supposed to be? Over. I can't you got me that time, Mac. This is American Flight 812 requesting. <laughs> Tower to American Flight 812. This is the one Over. bit in the film that just. Burbank Tower to American Flight 812. Those controls Over. above. Holy me. mackerel. Burbank Tower to American Flight 812. Are you in trouble? Trouble? Take a look for yourself. What in the world? That's nothing from zoom, this zoom, world. Zoom background is horrible. Burbank Tower to American Flight 812. Are you in trouble? Are you in trouble? <laughs> Mayday, Mayday, stand by, Burbank Tower. You suppose a passenger saw it? I doubt it. Most of them are asleep. But it was quite a jolt, Jeff. I'll check. Good. We'll get it ready for landing. And keep it quiet until we get instructions. Right. Okay, Danny. American Flight 812, reporting to Burbank Tower. Over. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give them this. The plot has like a nugget of a good idea. Okay, what was that? Did you hear anything? I heard I thought it a, did. A, Don't like hear noise. Dying? Especially when it ain't supposed to be any. Yeah, sort of spooky like. Maybe we're getting old. Whatever it is, it's gone now. That's the best thing yeah, for oh, us too. Gone. Yeah, let's go. So, daylight, obviously daylight, right here, and suddenly night, day, night. Day, night. So she, she actually had dialogue, but she, Hated the script so much that she told them that she was going to read it. The grief of his wife's death became greater and greater agony. This house is toward Johnson's house, actually, believe it or not. Sadie, she's obviously surrounded by a darker... The oh, home yes. they had so long shared together became a tomb. A sweet memory sweet of yeah, her joyous yeah. living. The sky the, um, to which she had once apparently looked... Apparently was now only a covering All these for her dead were body. Not really planned in the script. They wrote the script around these scenes. And you know, Bella 
Turtles, he doesn't do a bad job here. He, it's, it's kind of rather poignant. The oh, ever beautiful he, flowers in these she had planted. Bits, he's probably the best actor in With the her own movie. hands, became nothing more than the lost roses of her cheeks. It's just, it's just, yeah, he does a good job. Confused by his great loss, the old man left that home. Never to return again. And that's actually the last bit of footage of Bela Lugosi they have. He uh, sadly passed away before filming actually began. At the funeral of the old man, unknown to his mourners, his dead wife was watching. First his wife, How then he. Really fit in that Tragic. Thing? Tell me something. Why was his wife buried in the ground and he sealed in a crypt? Something to do with family so tradition. So what relation do these people have, have to Bella? Oh, I'm just well, curious. Well, it's getting dark. That. Let's be in our way. Are they friends, co-workers, distant relatives? Then, as two of his mourners left his final resting place. <laughs> Um, all the police cars and a lot of the police uniforms were actually provided by Tor Johnson's son, who was in the San Fernando Police uh, Department. I guess Tor Johnson's wife also provided catering. Oh, oh, really? Hold on. Moves Minutes up. later, the police, led by Inspector Daniel Clay, arrived at the scene. Can you hear me now? Who found them? The man and girl. Medical uh, examiner being around yet? Does this work a little bit better, Just my dear scholars? The motor okay. wagon ought to be along most any time. You get their statement? Yeah, much as we could. They're pretty scared. Finding a mess like this ought to make For those who don't know, Tor Johnson was actually a wrestler before he got involved. Well, no, he had been in movies before. He um, was a professional wrestler. Uh, he had been in films several times as a wrestler. Or as sort of like the big heavy. I'm a big boy, not Johnny. I love that line. Um, he... For, for instance, one movie that I know I've seen him in was, um, what was it? Uh, I think it was, was it Shadow of the Thin Man, I think? Where you actually get to see him in a wrestling match. Which is interesting, because it's a wrestling match from the 1940s, and things have obviously changed. Was he in Manos, the hands of fate? No, he wasn't in Manos. He actually wasn't. Oh, it looks like a bobcat tore into them. Yeah. Well, it would help if actually we could see hey, them. Lieutenant, did you get that funny odor? How could I miss it? Oh, that'll be the morgue wagon now. That line about funny odor never comes up ever again in the rest of the film. Uh, something's happened down the cemetery. A lot of police cars and lights. I stopped, but I didn't see anything. Oh, well, whatever it is, the morning paper will carry the whole story. Sorry, getting some snacks. You seem to still be up there somewhere. Maybe I am. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever seen you in this mood before. The man laying in the chair, actually he's been in a lot of pretty big name movies this so this movie was a bit of a downgrade for him something about your flight yeah what happened Jeff I saw a flying saucer saucer you mean the kind from up there what other kind would there be? It 
was shaped like a huge cigar. It was not Dad shaped like a huge too. cigar. We when saw it. it. it looked like a flying a saucer, flying not a huge cigar. Then there was a tremendous wind that practically knocked us off our course. Well, did you record it? Yeah. I radioed in immediately, and they said, we'll keep it quiet until you land. And as soon as we landed, Big Army Brass grabbed us and made us swear to secrecy about the whole thing. Oh, it burns me up. These things have been seen for years. They hear it's a fact. And the public ought to know about it. Bit of a there filibuster there, Edward. No, no, there isn't. All but what's the use of making Don't you say, look, scars back then were a lot wider. Last <laughs> night I saw a flying object that couldn't have possibly been from this planet. But I can't say a word. I'm muzzled by army brass. I can't even admit I saw the thing. <laughs> Okay. How the heck do you keep that quiet? <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh, but that's just like, what? I, again, I should not laugh at the dead body being fumbling into a ditch, but there we are. Clean twice, they just threw him yes, basically. I was gonna say these aliens are pretty bad at hiding themselves, but then what comes up later it kind of explains it. Everyone, say hello to Ed Wood's wife's chiropractor, ladies and gentlemen. Ed Wood's wife's chiropractor. They could not, um, after Belagosi passed away, they basically had to use this guy to fill in. Pyra actually put Sounds makeup like on first and then took a bus to filming location, so I can only imagine what the uh, passengers thought. At that apparition we saw had something to do with it. Come on. Vampire was a horror movie host back in the 1950s. And if you're wondering um, why she looks familiar, uh, she, she later did attempt to sue, um, I think, Elvira, I believe the name of the other horror host was. She attempted to Elvi uh, sue Elvira for uh, copyright infringement. Yes, Kinshawn, pre-Elvira. Yeah, she there? tried to yeah. to uh, sue her. Firefly, so did she de-age or did he marry someone like half his age? And that way? Yeah, yeah. I think, it, I think she was just was young. Or Ed Wood has no idea what he's doing. Inspector Clay's dead. So, Murdered. people have noted that police officer, if you'll see, he's pointing the gun at himself. Really That's charged. not a mistake. No, the actor yeah, I am. purposely Tell pointed the gun me. at himself because he wanted to see if Ed Wood would be, was paying well, attention the to uh, well, the direction. Left back up the car, boy Very obviously, he was not, and it got left in the film. Greater love hath no man than to lay down his life for another. It is always difficult to have last words over the grave of a friend. And Inspector Daniel Clay was a friend, a dear friend to me. Please to emote for, for the help the bell has of it. Rung Please emote. Career. Now we lay him to rest. A and also rest how they well not deserved. noticing her. But so Where are we in terms of space and location? <coughs> People turning south from the freeway. 
We're startled when they saw the three flying saucers no, no Hollywood Boulevard. Hollywood Boulevard. New petition on state tax? A woman startled by the sight in the sky telephones the police. Yes, she is very startled. So, new petition against tax appears in like almost every single generic newspaper at this time. Oh, and this is Ed Wood. Ed Wood making a little little uh, cameo here. For no apparent reason. There comes a time in each man's life when he can't even believe his own eyes. Saucers seen over Hollywood. Yes, I think we got that point. Flying saucers seen over Washington, D.C. The army convoy moved into the field. Rockets were quickly set up. Colonel Tom Edwards, in charge of saucer field activities, <laughs> was to make the greatest decision of his career. He made that decision. Colonel Edwards gave the signal to fire. He made the decision, which is the decision that he made, which is that decision that was the most important decision in his career. That decision. Decision. Someone once said the thing about Ed Wood is that he had a real passion for movie making. The problem was that he, his passion overtook his talent. He was, um, the 20, which decision, the most important decision of his career. The decision that he made, the decision of the decision. The decision. Just aim for the strings and they'll obviously that will stop them. Uh, but yeah, a lot of people have said Ed Wood and made movies because he loved making movies. That being said, of course, he wasn't necessarily as they had come, good at making them. They were gone. Even to the but he still made them. Radar and the speeding jet fighters. Radar was just a magic technology at that point, wasn't it? Quite a sight, wasn't it, sir? A sight I'd rather not be seeing. Are you worried about them, sir? Well, they must have a reason for their visits. Visits? Well, that would indicate visitors. Well, yes. Big guns, a usual way of welcoming visitors. We haven't always fired at them. Oh? For a time, we tried to contact them by radio, but no response. Then they attacked a town. A small <sighs> town, I'll admit, but nevertheless, a town of people. <sighs> People who died. I never heard about that, sir. Well, it was covered up by the higher so, One thing I'm noticing with this film is Take any fire, a lot of the backstory they're, any major disaster, they're uh, then referring to in here is a lot Flying more exciting than the actual movie. Rumor, officially. I mean, Phil, why can't we see like we them off again, the... Uh, what do they want? Where are they from? Where are they going? They, sir? Who? Well, this is a training maneuver, sir. We only did a little practice. Well, practice. you're a smug wow. little guy, aren't you? Yeah. I wonder what their next move will be. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a sign. What will their next move be? This, ladies and gentlemen, are our high-tech alien life Your forms. Your space commander has returned from Earth. Send him in. You have your report? We had to pull in here to Space Station 7 for regeneration. We're returning to the planet Earth. The, the high-tech spaceship is amazing. Yes, it's what astonishing. 
We contacted government officials. <coughs> they refuse our existence. What plan will you follow now? Plan nine. It's been absolutely impossible to work through these Earth creatures. Their soul is too controlled. Plan nine. Oh, yeah. Fine, they are the Plan height of efficiency and comfort. Get your shiny pajama uniform today. Long-distance <laughs> electrode shot into the pineal pituitary glands of recent dead. Have you attempted any of this plan as yet? This yes, guy's in the uh, excellent. This guy's enthusiasm just screams so middle far. management. We shall be just as successful on Plan Nine. Plan Nine from outer space. They have no suspicion of your movements. We had to dispose of one policeman. However, none of those risen have been seen. At least not by anyone who still remains alive. It's too bad it must be handled this way. But it must. Those who we take from the grave will lead the way for our other operations. Again, this is yes, not a bad concept. Report to me in With a days. much bigger budget and probably a tighter script, it could I be his Excellency wouldn't take our report really time. interesting. Well, had he been dealing with our own people, his reaction would have been completely different. He understands the difficulties of the Earth race. What do you think will be the next obstacle the Earth people will put in our way? Well, as long as they can think, we'll have our problems. But those whom we're using cannot think. They are the dead, brought to a simulated life by our electrode guns. Thank you for explaining. You know, it's an interesting thing when you consider the Earth people who can think are so frightened by those who cannot. The dead. Well, our ship should be rejected. <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah, seed's over, folks. Time to move on. Yeah, our ship's ready. Let's go. Alien 20 reminds me of Lost Skeletal Cadaver. Well, I'm sure that took a lot of, of uh, cues from. For those who have never seen Lost Skeletal Cadaver, it is a parody of uh, 1950s horror science fiction films, and it is glorious. I actually highly recommend it. If you haven't seen it, Please go and watch it. You'd love it. Okay, what was that? And back here. I still think you ought to go in town and stay with your mother until I get back. This is our home, and nothing's going to take me from it. Besides, most men try and keep their wives from going home to Mama. That's not the point. That's all the point there's going to be. Now toddle off and fly your flying machine, darling. But if you see any more flying saucers, will you tell them to pick another house to buzz? Be careful. Don't worry about me. Oh, you're the only thing I do worry about. Oh, forget about the flying saucers. They're up there. But there's something in that cemetery. And that's too close for comfort. The saucers are up there. You live next and to the a cemetery? cemetery? There. But I'll be really? There. Now, off to your wild blue yonders. You promise you'll lock your doors immediately? I promise. Besides, I'll be in bed before half an hour is gone, with your pillow beside me. A pillow? Well, I have to have something to keep me company while you're away. Sometimes in the night when it does get a little lonely, I reach over and touch it. Then it doesn't Scandalous. seem so lonely anymore. <laughs> a crazy kid. Love you, darling. See you Thursday. Goodbye, honey. Doctor Save, nineteen thirties Clark Gable body pillow. Oh my you know, goodness, that is scandalous. She closed the door. She didn't lock it. If you're especially nice, I may even lock the side door. And be sure you keep the yard lights on. <laughs> he 
He looks so enthusiastic about being here. You're mighty silent this trip, Jeff. Hmm? You haven't spoken ten words since takeoff. I guess I'm preoccupied, Danny. We've got 33 passengers back there that have time to be preoccupied. Flying this flybird doesn't give you that opportunity. I guess you're right, Danny. Paula? Yeah? There's nothing wrong between you two. Oh, no, nothing like that. Just that I'm worried she being there alone and those strange things flying over the house and those incidents in the graveyard these past few days. It's I mean, the graveyard you live right next well, to for some odd reason. Out those crazy sky birds. I could probably I build that set in the basement. I think anyone could. I hope so. If you're really that worried, Jeff, why don't you radio in and find out? Max should be on duty at the field by now. He could call Paul and relay the message to you. Hi, Edie. Hi, Silent. I haven't heard a word from this end of the plane since we left the field. I've just been giving himself and me a study in Silent. You boys aren't feuding. No, oh, no, Edie, nothing like that. Hey, Edie, how about you and me balling it up in Albuquerque? Albuquerque? Have you read that flight schedule, boy? What about it? We land in Albuquerque at 4 a.m. That's strictly a 9 o'clock town. Well, I know a friend that'll help us. Let's have the problem first. Huh, Danny? Oh, he's Friend that'll help you what? What? I read about that cemetery business. I tried to get two kids not to buy two Please get back to the things. actual interesting conversation, please. He thought it'd be quiet and peaceful there. No doubt about that. It's quite all right, like a tomb. I'm sorry, Jeff, that was a bad joke. That wasn't hey, I even a joke. what I came in here for. How's the coffee situation? Mm, that's for me. It sure wouldn't hurt a thing, Edie. Okay, be right back. And say, Jeff, make that call to Mac. Nah, not only does she throw cold water on my Albuquerque plan, but now she's are repeating cut, literally cut out of the Albuquerque side ball? of the set. I can't resist your charm, Danny Bully. Residents oh. near the cemetery. Now this Paid outfit actually was um, owned by Bill Lugosi. But from the blast, it was uh, the, moving figure the cape was used by Velagosi on the man. stage as Dracula, which he was actually buried in. Again, Lugosi is probably the best actor in this. That's the I'm same right. chair that was from outside. Okay, Mac. Thanks for calling. Good night. So the film's actual copy... Well, are they they're that close to the graveyard? I mean, it, like, is the graveyard literally in their backyard? Really funny. Well, the neighbors are quite... Oh. Yeah. Okay, I will admit this visual is actually really good. <coughs> this this scene is actually pretty well shot. Not this one, but the one you're about to see. This would suggest that they buried him with no coffin, which is interesting. Ah! 
And also, suddenly the gravestone changes shape. Again, for all the faults, the makeup they gave toward Johnson is amazingly well done. Although we probably couldn't see out of those contact lenses. That's all our monsters for the movie. Dr. Tim, he has a... <laughs> that face. Boom. Okay, scene, where are you go going with this? How far did she run? Where is the relationship between the graveyard, her house, and the road? Twenty, what a crappy graveyard. Mrs. Trent! Mrs. Trent! What's wrong? He shouldn't panic. He's obviously nowhere near them. Is it day night again? It's day night again! Take a bite of candy, my dear scholars, every time it switches from day to night to night to day with no clear reason. Tor Johnson's son Carl is supposed to be in this film in an uncredited role. I'm not sure who he plays. <coughs> so why are they here again? Man, the man can just... in a moment. You can open it now, Tana. Now, the woman who played the female alien, apparently she disowned any ties she had with this movie years later. The amazing alien spacecraft with office furniture. Turn off the electrodes quickly. They can't tell us from anyone else. Jacob's Ladder. Yes! Wait, they turned off the electrodes. Why is he still moving? It's tough to find something when you don't know what you're looking for. I don't think the lieutenant does either. Then what are we doing out here? I was off duty an hour ago. Ah, oh, don't ask me any questions. I'm just a hard hand just like you. What do you suppose that noise was? 
whatever it was, it's no more strange than the other things happening around this cemetery. Spirits like old Farmer Caller talked about. <laughs> well, maybe. The only spirits he saw tonight were those I smelled on his breath. Oh, don't forget, Miss Trent claims to have seen them, too. She didn't have anything on her breath. She was hysterical. Well, true. Oh, she was come frightened on. And in a state of shock. But don't forget Let's that thorn nightgown and the scratched feet. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. Guess that's why you're a detective lieutenant and I'm still a uniformed cop. <laughs> Sometimes it's only the breaks, Larry. Meantime, let's lieutenant, get going. Lieutenant, can Kinchon, I'd rather goth aliens it? to clown them. No, Fair, no enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. When for orders, I get out of here right now. <laughs> a saucer. A flying saucer? What makes you say that? Do you remember the noise we heard the other night? We were knocked to the ground. How could I forget? Exactly. But you're not remembering that sound. There you're wrong, Lieutenant. I'm with the fact the sound is similar, but what about the blinding light? Oh, haven't you heard? Been many times a saucer hasn't had a goal. How does all everyone know about kind, saucers all of a sudden? That proves it. What next, Lieutenant? Oh, Lieutenant, maybe this doesn't mean much, but uh, Jamie and me found a grave that looks like it's been busted into. What? Where? Why, uh, what? Come on, man, out with it. We haven't got all day to waste. <laughs> oh, uh, just uh, over there, beyond the It was a big right, thing back away. then, but did everyone know about that? Was that like... Look, Everyone suddenly have knowledge of it? Are you going to turn to your local grocer and the grocer's going to say, You know, well, saucers appear right. about 50% over the... Th Strange. If someone had broken in, the dirt should be piled up here somewhere. It looks like it's fallen into the grave. Where are you? Be out of Roswell. Uniform, yeah, true, you know true. Do we have the right to look down there, Lieutenant? Uh, technically, no. No? Well, this spot looks familiar, though. Yeah, we shouldn't investigate any further without the permission of the next of kin. Let's go get it. How? I see what you mean. The gravestone's down there. Well, let's go down and find out whose grave it is. How? By going down and finding out. Ah, oh, come here. Are you sure grave. you mean that, Lieutenant? If I didn't mean it, I wouldn't have said it. Scared? Well, why do I get hooked up with these spook details? Monsters, graves, bodies. Oh, all right. Wait, you've encountered monsters before then? Music. Casket's here, but nobody's in it. Can you read the name on the casket? It's too dark. Give me a flashlight. How about a man? Why would the name be Wish inside the casket? Let me have them. Okay. It's Inspector Clay's grave. But he ain't in it. Dun dun dun. But meanwhile, at the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. Right, G2. Come in. Yes, of course. I'll keep in touch. I believe that. Oh, boom mic! Oh my goodness, you can see the boom mic. Close the door. Look at the top of the screen. Boom mic. At ease, Colonel. Thank you. And they got it. I believe that's Lyle Talbot, I, uh, who was actually a fairly well-known actor. For many of our saucer attacks. Very wondering. Very. I'm, in charge of yeah, I'm wondering how they got him involved in this film. You believe there are such things as flying saucers, Colonel? Yes, sir. You've seen them? Yes, sir. You realize there's a government directive stating that there is no such thing as a flying saucer? Yes, sir. Do you stand by your statement that you've seen flying saucers? Well, uh... Yes, sir. Unit 20, he's been in other science fiction, has it? Marshal, so he, yes, yes, yes. This against direct orders. Though I can't remember which ones. General Roberts, may I speak freely? You may. How could I hope to hold down my command if I didn't believe in what I saw and shot at? I, uh, like you, Colonel. Thank you, sir. There are flying saucers. There's no doubt they are in our skies. They've been there for some time. What are we going to do about them? Why didn't you do anything about them? Who knows? Then uh, they really are there. I thought you were convinced of that. I am. We've had contact with them. 
contact? Huh. Radio. They speak our language? Well, not quite. We've received messages from their spaceships. For a while, it came in as just a lot of jumbled noise. And now, sir? Well, since they first uh, tried contact with us by radio, we've developed a language computer, a machine that breaks down any language to our own. General, uh... So you invented a machine that can me. translate anything, well, you've been in charge and you're just using it for talking to aliens. I think it's about time you heard these recordings. I don't know if that's brilliant or stupid. Huh. I'm anxious. This is Eros, a space soldier from a planet of your galaxy. I fully realize our language differences. However, I also know you finally have perfected the dicto roboter. The dicto roboter. On Earth call it the language computer. So you can now understand that which I speak. Since the beginning of your time, we have been far beyond your planet. It has taken you centuries to even grasp what we developed eons wow, of they are years arrogant. ago. Do you still believe it impossible we exist? You didn't actually think you were the only inhabited planet in the universe. How can any race be so stupid? <laughs> you need to set your mind at ease. We do not want to conquer your planet. <laughs> you just insulted them. What? <laughs> we could have destroyed it long ago if that had been our aim. Our principal purpose is friendly. Really? You I just admit, you just called them stupid. Certain means, which you might refer to as criminals. <coughs> that is because of your big guns, which have destroyed some of our representatives. Your big guns. If you persist in denying us our landings, then we must only accept that you do not want us on friendly terms. We then have no alternative but to destroy you before you destroy us. With your ancient, juvenile minds, you have developed explosives too fast for your minds to conceive what you are doing. You are on the verge of destroying the entire universe. I think that's a little we bit of an overstatement. Of universe. This is our last... That's the end of that one. Atmospheric conditions in outer space. Atmospheric conditions in outer space. Let's repeat that. Atmospheric conditions in a near vacuum in outer space. Interfered with the transmission. Oh, a couple of times, a few years ago. You're going to be there in the morning. Just a few minutes from Hollywood in the town of San Fernando. Reports have come in of saucers flying so low the exhaust knocked people to the ground. <coughs> there have even been stated claims of saucer landings. Major Carlson will replace you while you're out there. You're the best man for the job of attempting to contact Is he really? Them. Find them, Colonel. See what in hell it is they want. All right, sir. These are confidential reports, Colonel. Read them over carefully on the plane. Turn them over to intelligence when you get to Los Angeles. They'll have further orders for disposition. Yes, sir. Colonel Edwards? Yes, sir. Dragon Thunder, happy Halloween, Matsu. Thank Hello you, there, Dragon. Welcome. We are watching Plan 9 for Outer Space, and happy Halloween to you as well. This movie's so mind numbing. Meanwhile, back at this place. Second, third, ooh, let me get the popcorn. Oh, yes, indeed. Get, get plenty of snacks. We're in this for the long haul. We are ready to report, Excellency. You are many days late. It was unavoidable. We tried to transmit via televisor, but atmospheric conditions made transmission impossible. We should have transmitted as soon as conditions permitted. I thought time was of the essence. Suspicion has fallen upon our movements. Our ships have been viewed near the point of operations. And what has this added time gained, Eros? We have successfully risen three of the dead ones. Permit me to see one. Wow. One. Use your small electrode gun. Their plans, they've only risen three. I have taken two ships from your command. But that will leave only my ship. It is necessary that you continue your mission alone. 
I have need of your other ships <laughs> elsewhere. Which he will not Even say. Even though you have risen three of the Earth dead, the plan is far from successful. Well, yeah, you only have three. Eros was three. an operational success before more time, energy, ships, and your countrymen may be spent on it. Oh. We will not fail. Everything is on our side. Not everything. You do not have the live Earth people. <laughs> you reported that your ship was viewed at the scene of your present operations. That is correct. They have been viewed many times, but not at the scene of operations. Something must be done about that. Stop him, Turner. He's close enough. Turn off your electrical <laughs> No! 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 Stop him, Dennis! I can't get it! It's jammed! Stop him, you fool! Drop the gun to the floor, Tanner! The metal will break contact! That was... All this acting. That was too close! That was too close! Yeah. He looks so bored with this whole Bring thing. Bring the giant here that I may get a better look at him. <laughs> Do that that little hand thing. So I may get a better look at him. That little hand flourish. Oh, that is a chef's kiss of bad acting. Yes, he's a fine specimen. Are they all this powerful on planet Earth? This one is an exception, Excellency. What are the other two like? One is a woman, <coughs> the other an old man. An old man, you say? Yes, Excellency. Not really grabbing the cream of the crop, is he? This gives me a plan. Put the big one away. Pick up <laughs> your electrode gun. I don't know why that makes Make sure it's in working order before pointing it at him. The remaining jam seems to have been cleared by the fall. Take him back to the ship. Helium 20, Plan 10? What would be Plan 10? Dear scholars, what do you think Plan 10 would be? The old one must be sacrificed. Reland on Earth. Send the old one to enter a dwelling. <laughs> Dr. Tidium, put this. Then cut the electrical away and make sure and turn it's on working order. <laughs> the result will astound those watching. Astound them enough to delay their intention until you have gained your other recruits from the cemetery. Yes, Excellency. It'll be done. Report this plan this seems like it's really resource heavy with little reward. Eros, the Earth people are getting closer to that which we fear. Since they will not listen to our lame. Yes, our very lame. They cannot help but believe our powers when they see their own dead walking round again, brought about by our advancement in such things. As soon as you have enough of the dead recruits, Yes, Mark you're the advanced. The Earth, let nothing stand in your way. Again, their own dead will be used to make them accept our existence the and believe in that fact. Concepts not bad. At least the plan part. <coughs> if this was on a bigger budget, they could pr they could probably do something pretty spectacular and actually somewhat creepy. for a night, day, night. Mr. Miss Tran, this is Colonel Edwards from Washington, D.C. Good evening, Colonel. Hello, Colonel. Colonel would like to ask you a few questions. Questions? What about, Colonel? May I, uh... Sit down. Oh, I'm sorry. Toy Please same do. weird clause. Well, I want to ask you about yeah. the strange experience the other night when you saw the flying saucer. After that, the police brought me home. I hope I never see such a sight again. Well, after your description, I don't think I'd want to see it either. One thing more. After you were forced to the ground by that blast of wind, was it a uh, hot or cold blast? It's kind of hard to explain. It wasn't hot, it wasn't cold. It was just a... It was just right. Force. We, we 
couldn't get off the ground. The light blinded me so badly, I couldn't see a thing. We could only feel the pressure of the wind until it was gone. When the glare could left Could she see us, the colors of the wind as well? We could see a glowing well? ball disappearing off in the distance. Which way? Toward the cemetery. The cemetery which we happen to live right next door to. Which is within walking distance. Within 20 full cottage, yes. And here's Bella again. For another round. This is the most fantastic story I've ever heard. And every word of it's true, too. That's the fantastic part of it. Colonel, we found a lot of suspicious things out in that cemetery. Then again, we didn't find anything to base a fact or suspicion on. Hey, you hear anything? <laughs> Someone's car alarm's going off. You see anything out there, Kelton? Too dark, Lieutenant. But something started stinking awful bad. Oh, is that what it's supposed to be? <coughs> so they can raise the dead, but they can't this actually keep them from decomposing. Well, that's a little bit of weakness in their plan. Almost lost his cape there. You know, honestly, the fatal flaw in this is their thought process, well, the alien's thought process, is by doing this, it will distract anyone from checking out the graveyard where the aliens me. are. Didn't look that way a minute ago. How would man? that work oh, out? Excitement I forgot all about, Kel. Excuse me. Ah, he'll be all right in a few minutes. Did you see that thing? Did you get it? We got it. What was it? It didn't fall. I fired every bullet I had. So did I. I don't know what it was or what happened. But unless that bag of bones over there can reassemble itself, it's out of the running now. See? I mean, they're very obviously going to go investigate exactly where the source is. Colonel... I've been out here so often you think I've taken a lease on this place. Not a long If place, anything, this plan no, just exasperated the no, problem they were talking about. I can't help but feel the answers out here somewhere. Is the uh, girl safe? Mrs. Trent, you better stay with the car. Stay here alone? Not on your life. Modern women. <laughs> what? Yeah, what what was that line? The ages, especially in a spot like this. Go. Yes, sir. What was that line, Ed Wood? All right, Lieutenant. Now, you stay close to the officer, honey. I'd feel safer with you. Now, the lieutenant knows best. Well, I don't like it, but I guess there isn't much I can do about it. I... You have a gun? No. You know how to use one? After four years in the Marine Corps? Here. You think we'll need these? You never tell. Let's get going. Yes, I certainly would want to be guarded by this guy. Mm. 
15 and 20 wait under the blankets for the knock. So. to find out here. Well, there's only one answer to that, Mr. <coughs> we'll know when we find it. Inspector Clay's grave is right over here. Is that the one you told me was broken into? Yes. This it? Yeah. Looks to me like someone had broken out instead of in. I figured that, but that's impossible. Look, Colonel, some things just can't happen. Yeah, well, after that apparition that was draped across Mr. Trent's patio, I would say we should keep our minds open to anything. Look, Colonel, I'm a policeman. I've got to deal in facts. But I guess I'll have to go along with you. <laughs> you know, I'll bet my badge right now. We haven't seen the last of those weirdies. They'll discover our ship soon. You're going to let them find us? It's the only way. These are the same men who have been so close so often. They must Again, be your plan was to distract them away from your ship. In the car. They'll be taken too. What happened to your grand plan? Send the big one for the girl and the policeman. I'll turn on the Dictal Robotary so we may converse with them. <coughs> so in other words, what we're seeing here is that they are not actually speaking English, they're speaking some alien language. Just, I don't know, maybe. I don't know what you're trying to do. Maybe we're barking up the wrong tree. One thing a policeman learns, Mr. Trent, is patience. Where's that burn spot you mentioned? Right over there. Look. We'll investigate, but move carefully. Again, why would you leave her with this guy? So why is there a ladder outside the ship? A moment or two more, and you will be the first live Earth people ever to enter a celestial ship. Wow. Boy, how can anything that big hide for so long a time? I know, that's a huge ladder. I've heard metal sound like that before. What do you see? <laughs> Only my reflection. Must be some kind of one-way glass. I wonder how you get into this thing. There's sure a ladder. You climb out. up. What is the ladder there for? They're just outside. You can open the outer hatch now. Things speed around, we might just get in and off it goes. That's a These chance. three are Earth's well, representatives. I took a on those We're airplanes. Might just as well see what the inside of one of these looks like. Got your guns ready? I tell you one thing: if a little green man pops out of me, I'm shooting first and asking questions later. Lovely. Diplomacy at work. They're in the outer chamber now. Larry Mole Curly. No. Larry Mo and Curly would have dignity have compared to, to these three. <coughs> yes. Music. Seems such a waste. Well, wouldn't it be better to kill a few now than with their meddling? 
Permit them to destroy the entire universe? Again, a bit of an overstatement. Of course. But those are not my words. Those are the words of the ruler. Now you two stay right where you're at. We will do as you command. For the moment. No, for the moment about it. You just do as I tell you. You do not need guns. Maybe we think we do. They would be of no use to you now. They've been mighty useful before on flesh and blood. And you two look like you've got a lot of both. True, they would be effective upon us. If you were to have the opportunity to use them. Mister, if you don't get away from that control board, I'll show you just how effective they can be. Again, these are what? Shall we talk now or wait? Your friends will be here shortly. What friends? Those you left at the vehicle. If you've done anything to Paula... Take it easy, Mr. Trent. Oh, I assure you no harm has come to her. Would you like to see? Wow! Happy Next time you try trigger that, finger, huh? Board. You're a headstrong young man. I was only going to turn on the televisor so you could see her movements. Go ahead, my friend. Well, you Move just very shot at it. How is it going to work? I feel see a very large thumb. <laughs> She's only fainted. You <coughs> I? A fiend. Oh, here we go. I am a soldier of our planet. I, a fiend? Oh, no. We did not come here as enemies. We came only with friendly intentions. To talk. To ask your aid. Our aid? Yes. Your aid for the whole universe. Oh. But your governments of Earth refused even to accept our existence. Even though you've seen us, heard our messages, you still refuse to accept us. Why is it so important that you want to contact the There's a the little seed of, of a interesting because idea there. Death. Because all you of Earth are idiots. <laughs> now you just it's hold part. on, Buster. No, you hold on. First was your firecracker. Oh. A harmless explosive. Oh, no. Then your hand grenade. Oh, no. They began to kill your own people a few at a time. Then the bomb. Then a larger bomb. Many people are killed at one time. Then your scientist stumbled upon the atom bomb. Split the atom. Then the hydrogen bomb, where you actually explode the air itself. No, that's not what it is. Now it brings the total destruction of the entire universe served by our sun. The only explosion left is the solarite. <laughs> the what? But there's no such thing. The solarite. You, but we've known it for centuries. Your scientists will stumble upon it as they have all the others. But the juvenile minds which you possess will not comprehend its strength until it's too late. You're way above our heads. The solomonite is a way to explode the actual particles of sunlight. No! Oh, that's impossible. That, yeah. Even now, your scientists are working on a way to harness the sun's rays. That's not how it works. The rays of sunlight are minute particles. No! Is it so far from your imagination they cannot do as I have suggested? Yes! Why a particle of sunlight can't even be seen or measured. Uh, can you what? see or measure an atom? Yet you can explode one. A ray of sunlight is made up of many atoms. No! What? So what if we do develop this solarite bomb? We'd be even a stronger nation than now. What? You see? You see, see? your stupid, stupid minds. minds, stupid, stupid. <laughs> stupid. <laughs> I'm from you. Get back! Oh, whoa, whoa, big man, huh? Let him finish. Such a big man, <laughs> Tossy. What? The I love that. It's because of men like you, that all must be destroyed. Then why are you talking to them? Violent. No use of the mind God gave you. You talk of God. Oh no. You also think it impossible that we, too, might think of God? What? What? You, 
who wear the uniform of your country. What does country. that have to See, do with I wear the uniform of my country. Yes, we've had to use drastic means to get to you, but you left us no alternative. You didn't do anything! When you have the Solomonite, the Solomonite. Nothing. Nor does the universe. It won't work like you that. Think of solar and night, but just he couldn't it, even pronounce it right. Take a can of your gasoline. Say, this can of gasoline is the sun. Okay, this can of gasoline now, is the sun. You spread a thin line of it to a ball, oh. representing the earth. Okay. Now, the gasoline represents the sunlight, the sun particles. Here we saturate the ball with the gasoline, the sunlight. Then we put a flame to the ball. The flame will speedily travel around the earth, back along the line of gasoline to the can, That's or the sun no. itself. It will explode this source. Okay. And spread to every place that gasoline, our sunlight, touches. But it's not your sun. Explode the sunlight here, gentlemen. You explode the universe. No, you don't. Explode the sunlight here, and a chain reaction will occur direct to the sun itself. No! And to all the planets that sunlight touches. But it would, if that actually worked, it would destroy... The universe. No, it would not! This is it would not, stop. movie. This is why any means must be used to stop... It would not destroy the universe. Or as it seems, you want it. It is... Mad. What? Mad? Is it mad that you destroy other people to save yourselves? You have done this. Is it mad that one country must destroy another to save themselves? You have also done this. How then is it mad that one planet must destroy another who threatens the very existence? That's enough! Whoa, whoa, whoa! In my land, women are for advancing the race. Are you kidding? Wow, well, that is... These... Oh, aliens so advanced. Wow. We don't cling to it like you do. Our entire aim is for the development of our planet. Oh, my goodness. Oh, movie. Come on. He talks of, he puts himself on this big pedestal of moral high ground and then does that. What happened to you? How come you're all alone? <coughs> I asked for lots of help. You sounded drunk or something on the radio. I didn't see it with my own eyes. I'd never believe it. Believe what? It was horrible, and he almost broke my shoulder. Look, what are you trying to say? If you don't make sense, we'll never get to the bottom of this. Now, who slugged you? Inspector Clay. What? It was Clay, all right. Only not like we remembered him. Well, his wig was busted into, wasn't it? Next, you'll tell me you saw skeletons. We did, earlier. Now I know you're off your rocker. All of us saw it. The lieutenant, the colonel, everybody. Where's the lieutenant now? We've got to find him. Mrs. Trent is gone. I was left here to guard her. And you did a great job with that. Showed up and put me out of the running. And the second time tonight, and I'm getting darn tired of it. Which way were they going? Oh, that way. Come on. Oh, there's no way he could keep holding her like that. Then one day it could all be gone. It would not. One big puff of smoke. No. All of mine. No. All that out. The stars, the planets. It not even possible. Empty void. You two had better come along with us. Come with you? Where? The police station. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that is kind of funny. <laughs> so it seems you think you have the upper hand. Look out that window. Jeff. He is just about to drop her, you can tell. She is unarmed. But he would kill in seconds if I so choose. He looks like Tegas. Holy cow! Look there. How do you miss this sort of thing? It's Clay, all right. There's no mistaking that. And he's got Mrs. Trent. 
Get your gun ready. From all I've seen tonight, guns won't do any good. Clay is dead, and we buried him. How are we going to kill somebody that's already dead? Dead! And yet there he stands. That other one earlier, I emptied a full clip into him. I'm seeing it. That's the only reason I'm listening to you. Look, I've got an idea. Hurt him or not, we've got to try something. I'm going to sneak up behind him and whop him over the head. That ought to make a move. Follow me. Even when Clay was alive, he couldn't run fast enough to catch me. But when he does, you so and Mrs. Trenton run like lightning. You've been in a situation like this before? Oh, you think it'll work? Oh, anything else to try? <coughs> Music. I'll be all right. Take care of the others. Your men have felled the big one. This could only happen because the electrode ray is off. He'll walk again when I turn it on. Call it. Right there. What? Suppose the lieutenant and the others are in that thing. Well, well supposing there are Martians or something in there. I'm just kind of... Ed Come on, let's go. Open up in there. Open up. Get that door open. Colonel, I wouldn't know one switch from another. And the movie descends into chaos. Again. This is our advanced alien race. What are you doing? Why would you grab your own electronics? <laughs> Just go! He's saying because it's rude to grab other people's electronic suffers. He's the one who grabbed him first. He grabbed his own electronics and started throwing them around. See of them, perhaps. But sooner or later, there'll be others. Look! Yeah, that is a thing to think about. Have they caught that woman? That thing yet? Hey, that's right. There's another ghoul running loose. And it's my guess that she'll look like him. With the ship and the ray gun gone, they have no control. We gotta hand it to them, though. They, they're far ahead of us. Are you kidding me? No, they are not. <laughs> They're just as much a bunch of bungling idiots as you bunch are. My friend, you have seen this incident based on sworn testimony. Can you prove that it didn't happen? Yes. Perhaps on your way home, someone will pass you in the dark. And you will never know it. For they will be from outer space. Many scientists believe that another world is watching us this moment. We once laughed at the horseless carriage, the airplanes, the telephones, the electric light, vitamins, radio, and even television. And now some of us laugh at outer space. Okay. God help us. In the future. Yes, please. Uh, 
Oh, no. You know, they are right. I mean, if you think about it, all they did was defeat one spaceship, but there's an entire species out there who are just as annoyed at them as anyone else. Okay. Well. I'll see you all in the chat area to close out this spooky time. Oh. Mm. Oh my goodness. Well, we've had some fun tonight, haven't we? We we read some spooky, scary stories. I watched a movie which was mildly horrifying, but not for the reasons that you would expect. <laughs> Julian 20 Bravo Matsu. I can't take credit for that. Oh. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, uh, so, uh, let's talk about next week. Next week, I don't know if I'm going to stream on Tuesday. I haven't decided. I may skip it this week for reasons I'll better keep, keep to myself. And then Thursday, I don't know. Again, I will see what I can figure out. So next week will be a little bit iffy. We'll see what happens. We'll see how my mood is. And we'll go from there. So let us see if there's anyone we can raid this fine, creepy Halloween time. Da, da, da. That was indeed a movie, Cool Skeleton. Yes. Oh, Kintron. Yes, Kintron is is uh, streaming. Um, I think Kintron is doing a public domain horror movie marathon. Let's actually visit Kintron. Close off the night with another movie. Um, so then, my dear scholars, I say unto you, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Till we meet each other again at the study. Take care, and I shall see you next time. Till then, farewell, and... Bye-bye.